telling, uh, I guess, along the theme of things, a couple of stories this evening. Uh, one of them is the story of the Bunsen burner. And I, I'm sure you're all painfully familiar with this piece of apparatus. My job is, I deal with fire safety in industry, so I deal with oxygen fires and hydrogen fires and all different sorts of things, but in modern day applications. So this is quite different. And what I discovered was that this um, little piece of metal is part of a really, really exciting and important story, which I'm, I've now been enjoying telling everybody about. Um, I'm going to take you all the way back to sort of the uh, 1800s, because this is only possible because of the scientists who started to understand molecules and atoms and reactions and how things mix together. And the thing called the fire triangle came to be understood. Is everybody familiar with the fire triangle? You've got, oh, dear. <laughs> so you've got something, you need something that burns. You need some oxygen or something to give it oxygen to burn. You need some sort of spark to get it going. This is where I'm going to take the story to Heidelberg. Uh, Heidelberg was a you know, modern city in the mid-1900s, sorry, uh, mid-1800s, and it had just had this fabulous new stuff called coal gas lighting put in. It was a complete mod con. Uh, if you, I'm sure you'll remember that sort of yellow luminescent flame that comes off the Bunsen, that your science teacher sits there doing this to show that it's rubbish at heating. It's really good at lighting, though, and they had this put in Heidelberg. Now, at that time, Heidelberg University, which is the oldest in Germany, it's an amazing place, they were trying to get a professor, a guy called Robert Bunsen, to go and work there. And in order to entice him there, they said, we will build you a new building. This is how much they loved him. And we'll put in all the mod cons, including coal gas lighting. This is like offering somebody, you know, iPads and their own Wi-Fi network and everything all in one nowadays, uh, which only medical departments get. Bastards. <laughs> Now, luckily, it worked. He did go there. I mean, who wouldn't turn down a building? But this coal gas that was running through his building, he saw another application. He thought it could be used for heating. Now, up until that point, as I say, it hadn't been used. So he went to a chap called Peter de Saga, who's the instrument maker and technician there, and said, can you make me something that will mix the fuel and the oxygen properly that we can light and have a really good heating flame? Michael Faraday had done something sort of similar-ish that hadn't really worked years before, and it's not really clear how much input Bunsen had, but Peter de Saga went away and he built something extremely similar to this that enables you to have the yellow flame, but if you open up the hole, lots of oxygen feeds through and you get a really good heating flame. Now, in case you're wondering, Bunsen didn't screw over de Saga. De Saga and his family owned the rights to this and made a lot of money off of it. Just Bunsen was the guy, he was the showman. He was the Carol Vorderman to personal loans. <laughs> now this, of course, it, it revolutionized the way we heat things. So heating of homes, heating of food, this was incredibly important, but it's way more important than that. And that's because it's what they were using it for. It's why Bunsen needed that really hot flame. They were doing something called spectroscopy. Now, I'm not sure if anybody at all is familiar with that. That's about looking at the light that things give off. Now, again, taking you way back to the 18, early 1800s, people started to notice the sort of spectrum of the sun, these this colors coming out of the sunlight, had dark lines in it. These are called Fraunhofer lines, although they were noticed by a guy called Wollaston first. And they are the um, wavelengths, the colors of light that are absorbed by hydrogen and helium. And as people's understanding of chemistry improved, they started seeing that various materials absorb very particular wavelengths of light. But what scientists like Bunsen and his colleague Gustav Kirchhoff noticed was that if you heated materials, they would give off, they would actually radiate these specific wavelengths of light, the same wavelengths of light that they absorbed. So they burnt the materials in the Bunsen flame, And they used a prism. They focused the light through a prism and used that to look at what wavelengths of light were given off by particular materials. Now, I don't know if people, um, you might recall from school doing the flame tests where you put um, a little sort of hook in a Bunsen flame and burn it. That's a bit dull. So I'm doing this instead. Uh, here we got lithium chloride. Uh, this is just salt sodium chloride, 
copper sulfate. This is just me uh, methanol. Uh, and sorry, meth, methanol and ethanol mixture. And then we've got potassium chloride, which should be a little bit more purple, but you may not be able to see it properly. This gives this beautiful rainbow effect. And these are the wavelengths that these guys noticed. Uh, Gustav and Kirchhoff, they proved existence of elements like cesium and rubidium, and they supported a lot of other people's work. But the reason I love this is because it's what was done with this information that's so exciting. Uh, today, we use very similar techniques in forensics. We use something called inductively coupled plasma atomic emission spectroscopy. Oh. <laughs> you'll, all, you'll all be Googling that one later. Um, it's ICPAES is the, the acronym we use. Um, we don't tend to sit in the lab using those words. Uh, but um, it's using a hot stream of plasma to heat materials and looking at the same thing, looking at what comes off it. But the similar wavelengths, although we've um, sort of extended this into the infrared and the ultraviolet, the same principle is used when we uh, use telescopes to look across the cosmos to understand what um, various objects and galaxies and stars are made of. And it's, it all springs from this moment. Something even more important than that, though, has anybody heard of the Doppler effect? Uh, you might understand it as uh, the police siren going past, where it sort of changes pitch as it goes. Um, well, the same thing is true of light waves. And if something is moving away, those light waves, they get longer, the wavelength stretches. And as that happens, the colors shift a bit. It's called redshift. And from that, we can actually work out, using uh, instruments like Hubble telescope, how quickly the universe is expanding. And that all started with heating some stuff using this, which is, is one of those stories in science that I absolutely adore. It's, um, there's a phrase, standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, which is what science is all about. It's immensely exciting that something so small can lead to something quite literally astronomical. The other story I want to share with you is how explosives actually saved people's lives. And I don't think that many people would think of them as doing that, but they do. Uh, the first explosive was gunpowder, discovered by the Chinese in 220 BC. It didn't get to this country all the way until the 13th century. And even then, it didn't change. They didn't have any other explosives until the 19th century. Now, as I said, chemistry understanding was improving immensely, and people started doing lots and lots of different experiments. One guy uh, in Turin called Ascanio Sobrero in, I think, 1846, yeah, uh, he was actually doing various chemical experiments and discovered something called nitroglycerin, which you might have heard of. He thought this chemical was insane, absolutely nuts. He thought nobody should ever deal with it. It was too volatile, it was too mad. So he just put that research to the side and went on and worked for something else. But somebody who was at the same university uh, thought it was an excellent idea, and his name was Alfred Nobel. And he particularly thought this was a great idea because his dad owned a munitions factory back in Sweden. So he took the idea back, and in 1863, they had a factory making this stuff, and it was brilliant. And in 1864, the factory burned down. <laughs> it actually tragically killed Alfred's brother Emil, but these were men of business. They didn't let them, this, this didn't put them off. They rebuilt, they started producing again in 1865, and in 1866, the factory burned down. At this point, Alfred decided there might be something in this uh, Ascanio Sobrero's idea that was a bit too dangerous. So he started searching for ways to make it safe. Uh, and he found, actually, after lots of experimentation, that mixing it with a clay called Kieselgum made it very, very safe. Now, often in science, you find lots of people doing similar things at once. And one thing that happened was some guys called Schoenberg, Schombein and Boetger were developing something called nitrocellulose. Uh, Schombein found this by accident. Uh, he apparently spilled some chemicals on his desk and mopped it up, and he hung the apron up in the corner to uh, dry next to a heater. And he found as it, he, as it dried, this happened. I think he was quite glad he wasn't wearing the apron at the time. <laughs> Uh, but Nobel uh, discovered that if he mixed nitrocellulose together with nitroglycerin, that he could make something very, very stable, which they called gelignite. They marketed it as this, and this was incredibly safe to use. The reason that I find this so important is, because I've worked a lot in the safety industry, and one area I've had dealings with is the mining industry. Now, in the Victorian times, mining was just fraught with danger. It was so dangerous. 12% uh, of miners uh, died 
every year in, uh, well, in 1880 from these horrific accidents, usually some kind of explosions. There was methane around. But one of the biggest issues uh, was dust. Now, you might think that's a bit strange. You may not be familiar with this, but dust is incredibly dangerous. And a lot of people at the time didn't believe this. In 1803, one person noticed how dangerous dust was. He was certain that dust had caught fire through a mine and everybody ignored him. It wasn't until 1887, when there was a horrific accident at a place called Aloft's Mine, that people noticed that only the dusty tunnels had burned. So a chap called Henry Hall, who was a mine inspector, did some experiments. And he found that if you just set fire to dust, it didn't do anything at all. It just sat there in a pot. But if you aerated it, if you mixed it, something like that would happen. It's in very much the same principle as the Bunsen burner. You're mixing your particles of dust in the air, so you've got lots of oxygen there. The first particle releases enough heat to light the second particle. And this goes on, and it forms a flame front through the fireball. That was understanding of this and using much safer explosives that weren't just setting off places and not keeping them in dusty areas meant that they saved a lot of lives. And by 1910, less than 1% of miners died in these horrific accidents, uh, which I think is a good place to finish. Thank you.